Hi, and welcome to another Cup of Tea with Stephen. So I just have to thank my friends in Spain, Francesco and Hernando for sending me a lovely mug and for everyone that sent me mugs in. I'm getting quite a collection now. Um, so anyway, today I have a very, very special guest, someone that's very dear to my heart, um, patron of her charity. And I'm not gonna give too much away because I've a rabbit on. <laughs> she, she has lots to say, let me promise you. Let me introduce you to someone, um, an incredible lady, Anna Kennedy OBE. Hello, darling. Oh, hello, Stephen. Lovely to see you again. Anyway, as I was explaining to people, I'm patron of your charity, one of the patrons of my charity, I won't say that, and I'm a very lucky guy to be doing it. Um, but, you know, Anna Kennedy Online deals with people living with autism. And this is, this is an important question to start off with, and many people think, why are you asking it? But I was in a, an elevator in uh, going up to Regent's Park, uh, and there was a young man there behaving a little bit differently, shall we say, and a woman became alarmed. Uh, and the father said very nicely, oh, I'm sorry, my son's living with autism. And the woman looked none the wiser. Right? She still stood back like that. Instantly I said, oh, are you going to the zoo? And of course it calmed down. But a lot of people don't know what autism is. Could you explain to us? Yeah, well, first of all, I think if I was the father, I probably wouldn't have apologised. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you have to apologise for your son? Yeah. And the thing is now with terminology, um, it can be quite, how can I say, with the autism community, they yeah. like to be referred to as being autistic, not living with autism. It's like they're saying they're living with a handbag. It's just like they're living with autism. Um, yeah. So it's like they are autistic. Yeah. So um, the thing is, it is quite difficult to explain autism and the reason being is because no two individuals are the same and as you've seen from my own two boys they're very different from each other you've also met lots of individuals on the autism spectrum within the charity but the way I could explain it's like they find it sometimes difficult to communicate and interact with people so um you know Angelo sometimes can find it this is my uh, youngest son he can find it quite difficult meeting a new person but it's because he has other issues like sensory processing condition so it could be it might be that he might meet you and you might have quite a strong aftershave on and for him that would be quite daunting yes. because of the, it's, you know it's impacting on his sensory issues and a lot of autistic people don't just have autism they have overlapping conditions so it could be they might be impacted by OCD um, dyslexia dyspraxia and also I think the the hardest thing for a lot of individual is their sensory difficulties that they have because it can really impact on somebody. So they have difficulty with social interaction, certain aspects of it. They not, might not be able to read a social situation, you know, straight away. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a gentleman that was at one of our um, homes uh, that I'd set up uh, quite a few years ago, and he was desperate to get a girlfriend. So he went to the pub with his carer. <laughs> and um, he saw this beautiful lady and went up to her to ask her out but didn't read the whole social situation that she was sitting next to her boyfriend all he could <laughs> see was this beautiful lady so then obviously you know the boyfriend wasn't too happy and then it was explained you know this young man is autistic and then that was fine so obviously we have to teach a lot of um situations to our children and that's why we do a lot of role play so it's just like this is what could possibly happen in this situation these are the things you can say these are the things you can do so it's a learning process yeah. and it's also a developmental condition as well and the other thing is sometimes it can take a little bit longer to process information so say for example when I'm talking to Angela I might have to speak just that little bit slow or make the sentences a little bit shorter um, and then with Patrick he's just a mindful of information and very, very clever. But how did you discover that your beautiful boys uh, went a little bit different? Um, well, both my boys, I had two difficult pregnancies, but you know, I have seen um, media examples where they talk about it could be pregnancy, but I don't think that it is that. Um, it's just that, you know, 
Angela was born full term, but I was in hospital for the last 11 weeks of the pregnancy, which I found really tough. And Patrick was born very, very early. Um, he was born premature. And I thought that was why he had a lot of difficulties. Yes. So, you know, he's born 11 weeks prem. You know, we were in and out of hospital all the time, that sort of thing. Finding it difficult at school, being bullied at school as well because of um, his interests or um, he found it difficult to make friends. Um, and then um, Angela was diagnosed at two and a half because he had everything going for him, you know, eye contact, he was speaking. And I think I've probably told you this before, it was almost like someone came along and took everything away from Angelo. So took his speech, didn't want to be touched, didn't look at you, uh, was very, um, as I say, talking about his sensory difficulties that he had, uh, not sleeping. And it was just like he completely changed over a period of time. Um, where Patrick was diagnosed early at four, but then we weren't told until he was seven. And I only found out by accident because of the difficulties he was having at school. So yeah, so there were both different situations, but a lot of parents are going through um, a very long time waiting for the diagnosis for their children. Um, yeah. Some parents are waiting like on average five years. I mean, you're, you've been described in the press and by everyone I know as a biter. Uh, I mean, how do you find the strength uh, in a situation like that to fight for your children? Well, I get asked that a lot because of the lack of sleep that I have, as you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't get a lot of sleep. <laughs> um, but there's something inside me. I'm very passionate and very driven. And I think it's the love for my sons. And then I speak to many, many parents who are going through similar situations. And I think 20 years down the line, they're still struggling, you know, to find a diagnosis for their uh, loved ones trying to find the right type of school transition trying to find the right college trying to find support for their uh, sons or daughters that might have mental health um, trying to find a job it's just a barrier at every milestone and you have to almost become like a mini expert if you like and speak up for your sons or daughters and if you find that difficult find someone who can help you go to meetings with someone who knows the, the score if you like you know knows where the pitfalls are if i'm sitting here with my child uh yeah i think there's something i i, I suspect there's something different or or they might ha have autism you said to go to the gp but what other things are there out there to help me um, you can look, obviously, there's lots of information online. If they're um, quite young, that there's something called MCHAT, um, and it's for um, children that are 18 months and over. And it's, there's a lot of pointers on there. Does your child do this? Does your child share the toy with you when you, you purchase a new toy? Um, all those sort of things. And, and you just tick off what you feel that, um, is appropriate for your uh, child, and then it'll give you a, a score at the end. And then if, if that score says, I think you need to go and see the GP, um, then you can take that along with you and just say, hey, I've, I've done this online. And for adults as well, there's also um, um, something online. If you just type in autism for adults, the, yes. the National Autistic Society have got a lot of information on their website. If you're struggling as well uh, with uh, trying to find the right type of school, there's another charity website called Ipsia, and they have lots of template letters on there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So basically what you do is you find the template letter that suits your situation. Obviously, make it... Um, applicable to your son or your daughter and then you can use that letter for whichever stage you're at um, in the school so the special educational needs and uh, disability um, obviously once both my boys were diagnosed the um, Angela wasn't even offered a place a mainstream place a full-time placement um, at a school I was looking around I think I tried something like 26 or 27 different schools whether they were mainstream school whether a uh, uh, they were a special school, whether they were a school that had a unit attached. I was learning as I was going along. I was reading as much as I possibly could. And there was just no placements available because there was such long waiting lists. And there was one particular school I remember in Ealing. I thought this would suit both my sons. But they were teaching children in the corridors because there wasn't enough places. And they said, if you don't live in Ealing, there's no point in you even going on the waiting list because you're just going to be waiting years and the frustrating thing is which I've said this a million times is that you read in every single book about autism how early intervention is crucial yes. for our children and adults and I've seen that when we've set up schools I've seen the difference that it can make when you start working early with children giving them speech and language therapy giving them occupational therapy you know working with various different therapies it could be music therapy it could be drama therapy 
whatever it is that suits that particular child and what they need. So in the end, I was so frustrated. Um, I set up a support group. First of all, it started in my lounge at home because there was nothing in the area where I lived. Because the lady that had set up a group, she couldn't cope anymore because she had her own um, issues with her own family and her own son. And she just said, I just can't do it anymore. So I decided to set it up with another parent. And um, then all these families started coming out of the woodwork and speaking to families with adults that were at home or they were in psychiatric units or they'd been misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and not autism and then given medication for schizophrenia when they didn't even have it. So then they started getting psychotic episodes. So um, I thought there must be something that we can do. And then somebody told me about a school that was really near where I lived and I didn't even know it was there because it was hidden behind all of these overgrown, it had been there empty for 18 months and you had to go down this little path um, to get into the, the school. And it was the school for children that had physical disabilities. And because the doors weren't wide enough, they basically said they were gonna knock it down. And I thought this school would be perfect, you know, yeah. to set up. I thought, I don't know anything about setting up schools, but I'm sure I can find out. <laughs> And my husband had just finished a business and economics degree. So I thought, oh, that'll be good for the business plan. <laughs> so, so we started chatting to counsellors, MPs. They were saying, oh, you know, I went to banks as well. They were saying things like, oh, great story. Shut the door on the way out, more or less. What do you know about opening schools? Yeah. So in the end, the person that listened to us, with us, I always remember a gentleman who was a bank manager at Barclays yeah. and he used to be a special educational needs teacher before he was a bank manager and he said I can write a letter for you that you know basically we can't give you the money but it will help you <laughs> <laughs> it won't say, you are going to get the money but we're not going to give it to you same thing but anyway the council accepted it in the end so um they get they leased the building to us for 30 years and they gave us the first year with a peppercorn rent but anyway, to cut a long story short, I just went to lots of different organisations to help me, the probation service. I was there every weekend with the probation service because you had to monitor. I took Patrick and Angelo with me everywhere. I don't even know how I coped, <laughs> uh, but we did. And um, we had an 18 month plan, but we did it in nine months because I was so driven to think we need to open the school. So we opened with 19 children. I was like, it was amazing. And then after a month, I remember um, the inspector came and he could actually, at that time, they can't do that now, but at that time he could say, right, this school's not fit for purpose. I remember I was so stressed the night before. I was being sick in the toilet. I was just like, oh, what if they're gonna close it down? We put all our money into it, we'll lose everything. So anyway, at the end of the um, day, he spent the whole day there looking at policies, meeting the staff, meeting um, the, the children. And uh, he then said, um, if I had a child with autism, I wouldn't hesitate and send them to this school. I nearly jumped on top of him. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so anyway, from then, um, it, the school's now 24 years old and um, well over 500 uh, pupils have been going to the school aged three and a half to 19. But um, I'm, not, I'm no longer involved in the school and the college and the residential home now for, for a year now. And what I'm doing is I'm just focusing on the charity, focusing on all the different projects. I've been asked to be patron and ambassador to so many um, different groups now, and that's what I'm doing. But what does Anna Kennedy Online do? Um, Anna Kennedy Online, I set it up in 2009 because, as I was saying to you, I was horrified at listening to parents struggling, trying to get a diagnosis. How do, how do we find the right school? Where do we look? What do we look for? Um, transition, uh, once they get to adulthood, those awful forms that you have to fill out. So I decided I wanted to set up Panic Energy Online to help parents so they didn't feel isolated and alone. Um, and then, um, I started an anti-bullying campaign and I started working with the NSPCC and the Anti-Bullying Alliance. Yeah. And from that campaign, um, I just started getting these videos of uh, adults and children singing, autistic adult dancing, magicians, musicians, um, poetry, artwork. I thought, wow, this is amazing. And at that time, I just met Debbie Moore from Pineapple studios because I was at the woman of the year awards yeah. 
Yeah. And um, I had this idea because I, I had this love of dance that I wanted to do a dance DVD for children who were autistic. Yeah. Um, so I had this idea that I wanted to call it Step in the Right Direction. I wanted to make it cool. Uh, you know, I didn't want it to be like a tokenistic DVD. I wanted it just to be current and cool, doing, you know, street dance, tutting, popping, locking, all that sort of thing. And um, I went to Debbie and I just said, I've got this idea. And she said, oh, come and see me next week. So I went to see it. I couldn't believe that she just said it like that. Come and see me next week. So, so off I went to uh, her office upstairs at uh, Pineapple Dance Studios. And I remember when I went in the office, she had a Tina Turner um, dance dress that belonged to her. She had a picture of her, a photograph of her um, with the Beatles. And oh, it was just like a little museum upstairs. I was really enthralled. I was really, you know, quite honoured that she'd invited me. She was the first a woman to get her company into the FTSE 100, which was yeah. like amazing. Yeah. Um, so then she told me about Maggie Patterson and yeah. Maggie um, had been working with her for quite some time and she looked after the Pineapple Performing Arts. And that's when I met Maggie and that's when Autism's Got Talent was born. And we will be celebrating, as you know, 10 years. You know, I, I use Global it was launched to help the LGBTQ um, uh, community. Uh, and uh, um, and we have a lot of members uh, of Anna Kelly to the line LGBTQ. Uh, uh, growing up, were you aware of, of gay people around you? I mean, you come from an Italian family. Um, yeah. yeah, I was definitely aware of um, gay people at that time. But as you know, in the 60s and in the 70s, <laughs> I think a lot of people uh, were worried about coming out because yeah. they're worried about the reaction. Um, but I am really humbled and proud that we received so much support from the LGBT community. Yeah. And um, for me, no one should be excluded. Everyone should be treated as a human being. Yeah. Speak to people how you, and treat people how you would like to be treated, so. Uh, you were talking about bullying earlier. I, I know every, so I was really badly bullied at school. I never told anyone. Uh, I was a mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. You, you don't talk about it. Uh, and that's something we're, we're, I know the charity does. We try and get people to talk. Uh, yeah, we've got our Give Us a Break campaign, which is great, because um, what I do is I give it to um, some of our champions and say, yeah. right, this year it's your turn, I'd like you to do something with our Give Us a Break campaign. It started off with Ryan when he did his video, then we've had songs from Macaulay, who's one of my ambassadors, like Father and Son, Rap Duo, they did a rap. Yeah. We had uh, Lauren talking about her story and doing yeah. a song, and then she spoke on men's radio as well with Russ. Um, so it's to give them the opportunity and that's what the charity is about to give them a voice to give them a platform and that's why i do my women's radio as well and um gateway radio with aston because we give opportunities that people that would normally get that chance to have a voice and speak on the radio so that's, that's why we really enjoy doing it listen congratulations on katie price and uh, and harvey on the nomination which you you were a big part of um, uh, yeah, we're, we're excited about it. I got a lovely message from Hannah, who's one of the producers at Minnow Films. I actually got a call yesterday um, they're chatting about the second um, episode, which I'm excited so that it's coming along. But um, Katie, um, I've been chatting to her for a few years and I, I kept saying to her, you know, when Harvey gets to 18, you need to start early to start looking for, you know, a college for him. And she sort of hadn't done anything. And I thought, I know that you think you've got a year to go. But you really need to start looking because Harvey's needs are quite complex and he's got health issues and you're not going to find a college off the shelf. So I think I gave her a bit of a wake up call and thought, oh. <laughs> so I sent her, if, any, if there's any parents out there looking for colleges, if you type in NATSPEC, so it's N-A-T-S-P-E-C, it gives you a list of colleges for um, adults with special educational needs. So I said, you need to look at these colleges and you need to go visit them. You need to see what they're about. And I know it's difficult now because we're in lockdown. I said, but there are virtual tours. So she managed to get out and see a few. Yeah. And now she's finally got funding for the Star College and he's actually going to be moving out next week. And she is anxious. <laughs> she's happy that he's found a place, but she's anxious because she feels like he's going now. He's, you know, he's 18. He's still her baby in her yeah, eyes yeah. Uh, but it's i just said you just got to take it one day at a time katie so there's only people so many people look up to you who do you look up to i look up to people that make something out of their lives make something out of nothing who are determined who are driven 
who are passionate about what they do. I love it when I see somebody speak and they're so passionate about what they do. It's really refreshing. I just think, I'm not sure if I'm speaking out of turn here, but I just think a lot of people now, they don't want to work hard for something. They want instant gratification. And it's for me, I think you get more joy out of achieving something when you've worked hard for it and you can see the, the end the end result. Yeah. Um, so but I, I might be speaking out of turn. I have speak, you know, seen quite a few people where they just want things to happen like now and they don't want to put the work in for it. You seem to know the, um, tell us, uh, for those of us who, who will we'll be going to the palace, tell us about your day there, please. Um, well, when the letter came, it came, I think it was about four or five months um, before I actually went to, uh, before we could announce it. And my husband said, Anna, uh, there's this uh, letter from Buckingham Palace. I went, no. Nah. He went, there is. It's, he said, I've got it here. He said, and it's on the mantelpiece. I said, well, open it. He said, no, no, you've got to open it. He said, I'm not opening it for you. So anyway, when I went home at the end of a working day, um, I looked at the letter and I opened it and it said, you know, I've been recognised. Um, by Her Majesty the Queen for the work that I've been doing with um, special educational needs um, uh, and received an OBE and I thought oh my god <laughs> and then after that I remember running around the there's only twice I've ever run around the land <laughs> like ecstatic and that was when I received that letter and then when um, my book um, not stupid, went to number one on Amazon um, after I'd spoken um, with Fee Glover on the radio. And those are the twice that I've run round in a circle um, round that like, I was just like, but then it said we couldn't tell anyone, but I did tell my mom and I did tell my mother-in-law, my sister. Um, but then um, we went to Buckingham Palace. I remember being really nervous. I could only take two people with me. So I took my mom and Coral, oh, Coral. Uh, the lovely Coral um and uh they were ecstatic um and then uh we obviously it was really weird driving into buckingham palace with my car <laughs> and i remember at that time i used to drive with my crocs on i used to wear these crocs i know they're gross but they're really comfortable and then when i got out of the car i almost forgot to put my shoes on <laughs> can you imagine going over in a suit and a pair of crocs <laughs> my mom said i think you've forgotten something <laughs> so anyway we went up to the door and then um, I had to go to the right and my mum and um, Coral had to go to the left and then I met all these amazing people um, and then I met um, Gary Barlow, I met um, Kate Winslet, yeah. she actually came to me which I was quite surprised, she said I've heard about the work that you've been doing and she said I don't know if you know I've opened something called the Golden Hat Foundation. And she said she opened it because her daughter made friends with a, a, a young girl who was autistic. And she said that she saw all the difficulties that she'd been through. So she wanted to do something to help. So it's still going today after because I received it in 2012. Yeah. And um, she said that she wanted to um, meet with me and have tea, but it never happened. Um, but she, you want me to take it, Winslet? It was like it was like really unreal. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we had our photograph taken together and then um, I was interviewed by ITV News and um, it was quite a surreal experience. And then when I, I went, we were told what we could do, what we couldn't do. When you had to curtsy, when the Queen pushed you back with her hand, that means that you had to stop talking and step back. Um, <laughs> He's not talking. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> but she said to me, Oh, how are you boys? And she was asking me about the school. And I just thought, oh wow, <laughs> I thought this is weird. And then um I finished about um one o'clock, it was. Um, and then I went home, <laughs> I put the washing in, the toilet was blocked. <laughs> so I'm blocking the toilet, and I thought. In the morning, I meet the Queen at Buckingham Palace, and now I'm unblocking the toilet. What a weird day! So we haven't got much time, left, but because we've got to talk about Patrick, because he's your eldest son. He's done incredibly well, hasn't he? Uh, yeah. Bit, I mean, his love of dinosaurs. I mean, I I, I adore just dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, and I love reading what he writes about it. But tell us a little bit how well he's done. Um, so Patrick was premature. He was only two pounds when he was born. So you can see how healthy he looks now. <laughs> <laughs> Six foot two. Um, yeah, he was 11 weeks premature and he went through a lot of illnesses when he was young. We even had to have the last, last strikes as well because he was so ill at one point. 
but then obviously he was struggling at school mainstream so we set up the school because of my boys and then he went to college and um, then he did an apprenticeship in a garage he gave it a really good go for about 18 months and then he said mom it's not for me so I said okay Patrick you gave it a good go I and mean, I'm proud of you but he's made friends at the garage and he still goes and meets with them they go out for Christmas and yeah. he just he endears everyone that he meets yeah. but he has quite low self-confidence so he's always had a passion for dinosaurs. He absolutely knows everything that there is to know about dinosaurs. And once I got him a, um, a, uh, an experience, um, I just wrote to the Natural History Museum. I said, my son's really passionate about dinosaurs. Is there any chance that you can have a back staged yeah. for, if you like? He was like a kid in a sweet shop. And the paleontologist, Susie, I remember her name, she actually messaged me last year to ask how he was getting on. She was really impressed with his knowledge. Um, so um, then he um, got himself a job at Pinewood Studios. Yeah. And he's been there for three years now. And he was so excited that um, Jurassic World was being filmed at Pinewood Studio. He came home. He was out of breath because he was so excited. <laughs> mom, mom, you never guess what <laughs> said the film in Jurassic world the third part at the um there so he um it was all obviously cordoned off and then he bumped into um the producer i've forgotten what his name is now he'll kill me <laughs> i can't remember but the producer begins with a d and um he said hello to him and he went oh ma'am he said i was just like i didn't know what to do i didn't know what to say he said but i said i, I did say i said you can't say hello i said he's just a person like you type of thing so but yeah so that was that and then he wrote um a review about jurassic park yeah, read it, yeah. and he loves michael Crichton. he's written he's um read every single book of his and he thought he would put it on something called quora and it was picked up by um, somebody called Crichton, Jamie Crichton, no relation to Michael Crichton, but he is a screenwriter and he's written so many films and plays and what have you. And he said it was so refreshing to read Patrick's review. He said, um, don't stop what you're doing. And Patrick was just like over the moon with that. So I'm hoping that it's given him the springboard if you like to think i can do this so i'm looking forward to seeing dame anna kennedy i have a hunt <laughs> be happening soon uh listen, well you. hopefully i won't be blocking the toilet <laughs> later <laughs> well i'll tell you what if you become a dame we'll all meet you outside and take it and take you out well you don't drink anyway but we'll all take you out with a bit more no, that's the other thing i've never like my mom and dad never um drink so i've never come from a family that have drank it just doesn't really interest me and i feel because of my youngest son, Angelo, I have to be on... On board, board. Well, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have a glass of champagne for you and take you out for a, a chip buffy. <laughs> thank you so much. Love you a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank Bye. you for taking the time really, out. Look really to everyone. Fun.